So, while well, seeing some people logging on, I'm gonna start. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. My name is Shafiq Dawood, I'm the founder of Griffin Leadership. I had the privilege of being selected by the US Embassy in Beirut and the US Department of State as a Leadership for Democracy Fellow last year. This experience led me to Duke University, this ID, Duke Center for International Development in North Carolina, where I met amazing mentors and professors. Going back to our webinar, you all know the state of the world that we are currently living in. Regardless of the field or sector in which they're operating, organizations are now more needed uh, and they, than they were before. Leadership is also increasingly required, especially during this crisis. So the question that we should all be asking ourselves, how can we lead organizations within this high-risk environment? These are questions, or the main question, which, should, which Dr. Sisson has uh, kindly accepted to answer. To give you an overview about Dr. Sisson, the teacher at DCID Duke University, Dr. Andrew has over 30 years experience as a strategist, diplomat, leader, teacher, and mentor. He's a former uh, senior executive in U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. He worked with U.S. Department of State, Defense, and other agencies to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives and help other nations recover from crisis and achieve long-term development. That startup and restructuring of large U.S. aid operation in Africa, Asia, and the Balkans and advised foreign governments on policy and organizational reform. He taught senior military officers pursuing a master's degree in national security strategy at the National Defense University. Since 2018, he has been a senior advisor at FHI 360, which is a global NGO. Also, he created and taught courses at the University of North Carolina on conflict development and U.S. foreign policy. Once again, thank you, Dr. Sisson, for agreeing to give this webinar. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Shafiq, for your kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. It's a, a real pleasure for me to join you. I'm going to attempt to put up a PowerPoint and give you a presentation for about 40 minutes. And then, Shafiq, I understand you're going to moderate questions and answers. Yes, totally. okay? okay. So let's give it a try. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Good, okay. So I hope everybody's doing well during this crazy difficult time of coronavirus and that you're all staying well. Um, this webinar is gonna focus on organizations such as NGOs working in developing countries that are high risk environments. But COVID-19 makes clear that all countries now are high risk environments, not only in the Middle East or North Africa, but including North America. And it also makes clear that we are all connected to each other. My presentation will have five parts. The first is what is leadership? Second, understanding the context for the organ, your organization, especially understanding risk. The third part will be setting the direction for your organization. Fourth part will be building a strong team. And the last section will be leadership in times of crisis. So what is leadership? Is it the same thing as management? I'd say they overlap, but they're not exactly the same thing. Leadership tends to be more people-centered and management more machine-centered. So management's about the machinery of running an organization, operations, systems, processes. Leadership 
needs to pay attention to all of that, but it goes further. It's about inspiring people. It's about motivating people, taking advantage of the management, but going further to achieve your common goals. And to do this, you need trust and you need motivation. I think it's good to have a, an example. For me, Nelson Mandela is the greatest leader of my lifetime. And um, he liked to garden. I mean, he's obviously most famous for being uh, the leader of South Africa post-apartheid. But even before he became a political prisoner in the 1960s, he was a gardener as well as being a political leader. And when he was a prisoner in Robben Island for 27 years, he was also a gardener. And I love this metaphor that he wrote about, about how being a gardener for him is like being a leader. Um, and those qualities of being a gardener, I think are very true for being a leader. But this picture of him tells a really important story about his leadership. Uh, during the era of apartheid, South Africa was um, banned from international sports competitions. It could not participate in rugby championships or the Olympics. But after apartheid and ended and Mandela became president, South Africa could once again participate in international sports. And the national support of, of South Africa had been rugby. And Mandela's advisors told him he should not support rugby any longer as the national support as the national sport because it's a sport of white whites and not blacks. And Mandela refused. He said no. He wanted South Africa to be an inclusive nation where whites and blacks all felt free to be South Africans. And rugby and maintaining rugby was important for that. So this picture shows his vision for South Africa, which is inclusion. But it's also a great picture of Mandela, the communicator. And using symbols to communicate his vision. Now, you may have seen this in the, in the movie Invictus, but I first heard about this years before from a white Afrikaner who told me that after Mandela took power and the blacks were in the majority power, his friends were leaving South Africa. And he was thinking about leaving South Africa. But when he watched this on TV, where South Africa was hosting the championship of the world rugby match and they defeated New Zealand and Mandela congratulated the white captain of the rugby team and he wore their rugby shirt. This white Afrikaner guy told me when he watched this, he started crying and he said, maybe I can stay in South Africa. So this symbolic act was an extremely powerful way that Mandela, the leader, communicated his vision. Symbolic acts could be very important, not just words. So let's talk about the challenge for leadership. I think a, a useful framework for looking at the environment you're dealing with is VUCA. The environment you're working in is volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And the answers that you may come up with are also not going to be clear cut. Leadership in a VUCA environment is hard. So let's turn to understanding your high risk environment. Your environment is the context for where your organization is working. And the context includes many things that you need to look at, social, economic, political conditions, geography, key actors and stakeholders, 
uh, opportunities and constraints, resources, who makes decisions. You should look at all of this. You might want to do a stakeholder analysis. You may want to do sector analyses, like in the education sector, if that's where you want to engage. But in my presentation today, I'm going to focus on risk, which is an important way of looking at your environment. Risks that are external to your organization, but could influence or impact your organization. It could be an environmental disaster. It could be conflict. It could be something that happens politically or in the financial sector. It could be something related to technology. And then we'll also talk about internal risks, such as a scandal or corruption involving your staff. You should look at risks in terms of the likelihood of their occurrence, and if they occur, the potential impact and whether it might lead to crisis. Every year, the World Economic Forum publishes a global risks report. So the report for 2020 came out early this year, and it was based on survey data generated late last year. They asked over a thousand respondents, they call them multi-stakeholders. These are leaders from governments, business, and civil society. They asked them to look at 40 different kinds of risk, both in terms of likelihood and impact over the next 10 years, in terms of which risks could potentially have the most important impact on multiple countries, or industries over the next 10 years. And as and 1047 leaders responded. And as you can see, five of the risks in the top 10 are environment related. Two are related to technology like cyber attacks. One relates to global government governance, one relates to water crises, and one is financial. As you can see, uh, none of them put infectious disease or pandemics in the top 10, though it was included among the 40 in the survey. But when they talk about potential impact, that is what happens if the risk actually becomes a reality, like there's a bad condition or event. Again, environment related risks are in the top five and infectious disease uh, comes in the top 10. So these global leaders uh, got it right on impact, but they got it wrong on likelihood when it comes to coronavirus 19. But this is global. When you look at risk in your countries, the, the composition of the risks could be different. You're gonna need to look at it country by country. So now what I'm gonna do is quickly share with you some resources for looking at risk and understanding the conditions in the countries where you may be working that could, could lead to risk. The first is um, that the UN and World Bank have many data sets, country by country, uh, on risk or underlying conditions that could lead to risk. Good one is the UN Human Development Report. There are other UN agencies that provide data on crime or on environment, and then the World Bank has a rich data set. By the way, all of these uh, slides that I'm showing you on uh, resources on risk are available online and are very easy to access. But it's good to look to what the individual countries are putting out. National development plans, De demographic and health surveys are very useful. Often they're done every five years in many countries, and they look at uh, primarily population and health data, but also education, uh, gender-based violence, and they relate it to income and, and geographic location. So it's a rich database that you can use for understanding social conditions in the countries where you're working. 
governance is really important. Laws, policies, regulations, all of these are important. They may be transparent, they may not be. And even if they're published, uh, they may not be consistently applied. Corruption is one category of governance, and all of these can affect your operations and make your environment more risky. A Transparency International puts out a highly respected uh, perception of corruption um, database that you can look at for the countries where you're working. Another good resource is put out by the EU, the Index for Risk Management. And their methodology is good because it not only looks at hazards and exposure like natural disasters or conflict, but they look at a country's vulnerability to risk, to these hazards, such as socioeconomic conditions and vulnerable groups like internally displaced. And then they look at the country's coping capacity to deal with risk. And this includes different dimensions of governance as well as physical infrastructure, such as roads and communications. So in fact, when they estimate risk country by country, they, they look at it along these three dimensions, hazard and exposure, vulnerability, and coping capacity. The World Bank and UN do this as well, that the coping capacity is important. And the U EU and the UN use this index for management of programs. Another good resource is um, a framework that the UN and EU have established called GDAX, Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System. This provides real-time data on, on potential natural disasters, such as tropical cyclones, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, droughts. So you could move over to uh, a, your screen, and if it's red, it's potentially really serious, high human impact. If it's green, like a tropical cyclone Arthur, which just uh, touched the North Carolina coast, the, 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 the impact was lower. But this website also provides um, real-time data, including uh, satellite imagery and maps, and provides a mechanism for uh, disaster response players to work with each other. USAID disaster response experts uh, recommend this system. Another interesting one is put out by an NGO called Humanitarian Tracker. And they use crowdsourcing to provide real-time data on outbreaks of conflict, human rights violations, disease, and disasters. Here's, this is picturing their Syria tracker, which you could take a look at online. And you could work with them to design a tracker for countries where you're working. My next two slides are going to be sources from the US government. The first is from my former agency, US Agency for International Development, the Famine Early Warning Systems Network. Um, and it provides uh, data and analysis about the potential for famine. It looks at um, on, uh, on rainfall, on potential drought, food delivery systems and logistics, availability of inputs. So it can help governments and other organizations um, judge whether or not there could be a famine and where it's located. Um, it's very useful for planning. When I was in Kenya in the early 2000s, we use this to predict drought in Kenya. And this was not only important for predicting drought and planning for a response, but it was also useful for the Kenyan government for energy supply planning. Because much of Kenya's electric power generation comes from hydropower. 
And with the prediction of drought, they could predict that their hydropower generation would fall. So based on that, the Kenyan government bought on, on advance forward contracts, electric power from its neighbors before the price rose. The last slide I wanna share with you is from the US Department of State, which has established overseas security advisory councils in countries around the world. It's a partnership between the US and American private sector, including business, NGOs, and uh, universities to share information relating to security. And besides a traveler toolkit, it's got two really good resources that are available to anybody online. One is uh, up-to-date security travel advisories and alerts. So you could click on that and see what's the story with COVID-19 in your country? Or is there some sort of crime threat or terrorist threat that you ought to know about? And then the crime and safety reports are more detailed. These tend to come out every year. And they look at a wide range of factors such as travel risks, uh, road safety, public using public transportation, terrorism, civil unrest, cybersecurity, environmental hazards, what's going on in the medical sector. This also is a good resource for understanding these kinds of risks. However, you shouldn't go too far. Websites and reports are helpful, but they're not enough. You need to get good local contacts to get good current information, get the facts, dispel rumors where you're working, such as local leaders, other people in local groups, government officials, people in the police, the army, the weather service, uh, when I worked in Sri Lanka, contacts in the weather service were really good for learning about flooding. I, maybe it's journalists. You should have just contacts of people you meet on the street, whether it's a taxi drivers or local students or your no neighbors. But these are really important. And then I would look for triggers to help you anticipate a risk becoming something far worse. It could be a new law or regulation. It could be an incendiary speech, inflammatory actions like imploding in place discriminatory practices in an education system or by the police. It could be an election that some group thinks is really unfair or an environmental shock like a flood or an economic shock. So pay attention to these, have your staff pay attention to these so you can anticipate. It's good to know what your risk tolerance is for managing your organization, your risk appetite. USAID does this and it publishes it online. It looks at all of those risks and breaks it down into these seven categories with many subcategories. And it judges what is USAID's risk tolerance for each of them. So for instance, fiduciary risk includes corruption. USAID has very low tolerance for corruption in its programs. So if you have low tolerance, you're gonna need more controls to minimize or mitigate the risk. So for instance, when I was in Pakistan, we were very concerned about corruption affecting our programs. So we put in place a lot of measures to manage that risk. We had an office of inspector general next door to us in our office. We did a lot of audits. We established a partnership with Transparency International to set up a hotline in Pakistan. So Pakistanis could make anonymous calls directly to our inspector general about providing tips about corruption in our programs. And then our inspector general would track them down. I recommend when you do look at risk, you also think about 
what your tolerance is for risk and how you want to approach it. Another good tool is a risk management register. And break this down into very specific risks, then its likelihood of occurrence, how serious the impact would be, and then what you want to do about it to manage the risk, such as having insurance or providing security alerts or provide training or set up a compassionate fund. Figure out who is going to take the lead and budget for it. Many organizations use this. It's a, it's a very helpful tool. So that concludes my, my, the section on understanding risk in your environment. So let's say you've done a good job understanding your environment and understanding risk that's important for your organization. Where do you want to take your organization? What's your direction? I think it's important to have clear mission, vision, and values. These are useful anywhere at any time, but they're especially important in a VUCA environment, an environment that's volatile, uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous, there's a lot of fog. It's hard to see where you're going and things are changing. Mission, vision, and values are especially useful in that kind of environment. They build a foundation for your team. They give your, sense, your team a stronger sense of being grounded. They give you a common sense of purpose. They guide ethical behavior. I would recommend that you develop these and you communicate them clearly inside your organization and outside. It's important that they be concise, they can be compelling, and that they're easy to remember and easy to communicate. Let me give you just two examples. One is from the Danish Refugee Council, which is one of the world's leading NGOs. And as you can see, they've got a, a good statement. But what impresses me also about Danish Refugee Council is they train every one of their staff on this. If you're interested, you could go onto the website and you could look at the training video they use to train their staff on their mission, vision, and values. The other one I'm going to show you is from Starbucks, which I think has a catchy mission because it relates their cup of coffee to the human spirit people and the communities where they work. It's compelling. Okay, let me turn to strategy. I think it's important to have strategy. That is, what it is you want to achieve to achieve your mission. What are your goals and objectives? And how do you want to achieve it? I'm not going to talk about now how to do a strategy, though if you want, we can discuss that in the questions and answers. But I just want to give you an example from my experience of how it can be useful. When I, in, in Pakistan, when I was director in 2010, when I went out there, there was an epic flood underway. A territory the size of Italy was underwater. Almost 20 million people were displaced. And when I arrived, um, the government response was already underway, and the donor response, including from USA, was underway. And they were doing a good job. But what I found when I arrived was that the USAID mission and the USAID office and the programs were in disarray. There was no common sense of purpose among the staff. It was demoralized. Uh, there was no strategy. Uh, we had a gigantic portfolio of over 140 projects uh, with a budget of $1.3 billion and virtually nothing was happening. And our reputation uh, within the US government and in Pakistani society was, was not good. 
So I was sent out. Oh, and one of the reasons why staff were demoralized is that many of the American staff were, were sent home because of performance issues. So I was sent out to Pakistan to, to, to turn this around, to fix it. So I, I sensed quickly that the, the, the mission lacked a common sense of purpose and all of these problems. And one approach I took to fixing it was quickly putting in place a strategy. And uh, we did it fast, maybe too fast in some ways. I made a lot of mistakes while I was there, but a good decision was putting us place a strategy quickly because then we got common agreement with the government, with all the agencies of the US government and within our own team what were the five priorities for our program? Then we could align our staff, our budget, our projects accordingly. We were able to cut by over 50% our portfolio. We just ended the projects. And then we focused on what was remaining and we implemented and we got good implementation. So I'm showing you this picture of the Gomelzam Dam on the Afghan border, because was the, this was the first major infrastructure project that we got going um, after um, we put the strategy in place. We also needed to adjust. We needed to adapt our management as conditions changed. But having a clear focus on five objectives was helpful. But even more important for our success and strategy than strategy for our success in Pakistan was having a strong team. So I want to talk now for a couple of minutes about how you build a strong team. I mean, there are thousands of books on this. So I just want to talk, make a few points that I think are important from, from my experience and others. First of all, you want to avoid a headline like this. Following the 2010 earthquake, Oxfam staff hired sex workers from earthquake survivors. And then compounding that horrible thing is that Oxfam management covered it up. But of course, the media found out it became public, it blew up. And Oxfam, which had a sterling reputation, its, rep its reputation really suffered. And their fundraising also suffered. So the message here is take strong measures to avoid this. You need to have policies, training and accountability in key areas of high risk for your organization. That includes um, sexual abuse and harassment, rec recruitment policies. It includes the safety and security of your staff. You need clear policies on this to try to keep people out of trouble. Train them, give them the resources, and then have good mechanisms in place for accountability such as what we had in Pakistan with our hotline. So you try to catch problems before they, pro they blow up. In the case of Oxfam, they did take good measures eventually to deal with this. All of these areas, policies, training and accountability, and you can read about it on their website. These are really important to avoid scandal and keep your people out of trouble. It's really important to recruit the right kind of people for a VUCA environment. Uh, of an, hiring an accountant to work on a program in North Carolina in the US is not the same as recruiting um, an accountant to work on a program in Eastern Congo. You, you want both of them to have good accounting skills. But you also want that accountant in Eastern Congo to have the ability to succeed in a high risk environment. 
You want people who are comfortable dealing with uncertainty and volatility. You want people who can think outside their lanes. They're interested in their environment and how it affects them. Um, you want to also recruit for diversity. Um, diversity meaning a range of backgrounds, experience, perspectives, gender. You don't want only people who all look the same and think the same around a table. That's a recipe for failure. Uh, a good example of this was there was a study done in the United States over two decades of over a thousand banks. And they found that banks with boards of directors that had fewer bankers on the board were less likely to fail. And the reason why was because they were less likely to have groupthink and they were more likely to ask the hard questions to make better decisions. I'd also ask you to think of, to be open-minded and respect the views of everybody on your team, not just your senior staff. Um, keep an open door, keep an open mind. Um, this is a picture of a vanilla farmer in Indonesia and he represents for me the best decision I made on a project in Indonesia. In a, after some analysis and a large meeting, I decided not to fund this project. But afterwards, um, an agriculture officer who did not speak up in the meeting came through my door, closed it, and explained to me why I was wrong. He didn't feel comfortable speaking up in the meeting, but privately he really let me have it. And he convinced me why I needed to change my decision. And I did. And I explained it to the other staff and we funded the project and it turned out to be spectacular. We set up a new partnership with private companies. We developed our relations with the local government and we had a huge impact on farmer incomes in the poorest part of Indonesia. And the last point I want to make is about taking care of your people. It's important to build the resilience of your staff, their ability to work in high stress environments and to bounce back from shocks. One way to do this is to recruit the, the right kind of people but also give them training, give them support, give them feedback, uh, and give them a rest. Also, it's important to take care of yourself. If you take care of your people, they will take care of you. It's important to build a culture of innovation in your organization. You're gonna be working on hard problems. You're going to be working in an environment that's hard to understand and it's risky. You need all the resources you can get to solve those problems and have a good program. Innovation is really important. But as Thomas Edison said, it's not just good ideas, it's really hard work. You need to build a culture where it's encouraged not only to have great ideas, but it's encouraged to, to have the hard work, to test things, to embrace failure and learn from it, and where failure is a good thing. Google uses this approach when it launches new project, new, pro, new um, products. It calls its approach launch and iterate. They use this with Google Chrome. USAID uses this approach for promoting innovation to solve really tough development prob problems. And it has a fund for this called Development Innovation Ventures Fund. So I wanna give you an example of this in Kenya. Great ideas can come from anywhere. And in Africa, traffic accidents are the leading cause of death 
among young people aged 19 to 25. And when I lived in Kenya, there were many reasons why Kenya was a high risk environment. But day to day, traffic accidents was the greatest source of risk. And minibuses, which are called mutatus, like the one picture, pictured on the right, were the greatest cause of traffic accidents and fatalities in Kenya. They were overcrowded and they drove like maniacs. When I was in Kenya, the government answer to this problem was regulation, such as requiring use of seat belts, limiting the number of people who could be in minibuses. Those regulations uh, did not work. And the traffic accidents and fatalities caused by these guys continued. But Georgetown University faculty and students later came up with a really radically different solution called Zusha. Zusha in Swahili means speak up or protest. And their approach was encouraging passengers to tell the drivers to drive carefully, such as by putting stickers inside the minibuses. And they also had incentives for drivers. And then they launched this with USAID funding, and then they tested it with randomized control trials. They iterated, they changed their approaches so that now it's reaching 55,000 transporters in cooperation with the, uh, the Kenyan government and an insurance company, and accident claims are down by 25%. I think this is a great example of innovating ideas and launch and iterate. Okay, my last section is about how do you lead in a crisis? Uh, this is the last topic. I'll share just a few points. First of all, what is a crisis? Um, the Center for Creative Leadership based in North Carolina in the US has done some really interesting work on this that you can find online. And they break down crisis into three levels. The first being um, the mildest. There could be public embarrassment. Uh, the success of your mission is threatened. This could be, for instance, a scandal involving your staff. This kind of situation, the problems are generally known and the solutions are known. Level two crises are much more serious. There could be property loss, maybe there's loss of life, and potentially serious damage to the reputation and mission of your organization. Here the problems tend to be known, um, but the solutions still are relatively not known and you need to figure it out. Level three crises are the most difficult loss of life, significant property loss, and they threaten the survival of your organization. Here, the problems tend to be very difficult to understand and the solutions are not known. There is no playbook. Uh, particularly in this level three, uh, crises are often characterized by chaos, uncertainty, and fear. What's different about leading in a crisis. Whether it's my experience uh, lit, working in Kosovo in 1999 and the, the two or three years after the war to living in the United States now, in both cases, crises include lack of information, rapidly changing information, and a lot of rumors. Crises are rumor rich environments. Uncertainty is magnified and there is fear. Your staff will have anxiety and fear about their job security, maybe about the fear for their families and their security. As a, as a leader, you're gonna need to make even more difficult decisions than you would normally make. And you're gonna need to make them quicker. 
Because if you don't make decisions quicker, more lives can be lost. So you're in this really difficult paradoxical situation where you need to make more diff difficult decisions faster, but you don't have as much good information as you would like. All, the, all leaders want information to make decisions, but it's gonna be particularly hard to get it. This means you need particularly good judgment, and you need to have a good range of sources and contacts to help you make the best informed decisions possible. And then you're gonna to need to adapt as new information comes in. Taking a step back, it's really important to be prepared for crises. It's good to have a crisis management plan that anticipates different kinds of crises that could hit your organization. And then for each one of those, plan in advance what you need to do. What are the key roles and responsibilities? Who takes the lead? What actions would you take if there were that kind of crisis? Have up-to-date contacts, people you can contact to get real-time information and figure things out. Put arrangements in place in advance. This could be food supply, water. Very important to have alternative communications in place, such as a radio system in case your phone system goes down. Could have arrangements in place with other organizations to deal with logistics and information sharing, such as fuel supply or what's going on in a certain place at a certain time. And then train on it, practice on it. When I was with USAID overseas, part of American embassies, we called this emergency, we called this an emergency action plan. We did all of this. And then we trained on it so that people would know what to do. And it was very useful. A good resource on this is the global Interagency Security Forum. It's a network of over 100 NGOs based in London, and they have templates and training on this that you can use. My last slide on this is going to be principles of crisis leadership. And you can find a lot of good webinars on this these days, but I think a really good source is uh, the, the Duke University basketball coach. Um, I moved to North Carolina recently and became a college basketball fan because Duke University and its rival University of North Carolina have really great basketball teams. And Coach K, as he's called, is considered one of the greatest basketball coaches in the United States. But he's also an important leader in Duke University as well as for collegiate sports around the country. And a month ago, he was interviewed about leading his basketball team during the coronavirus. And I love this quote. <clears throat> you are the owner of your attitude. How are you gonna show up to work during a crisis? How do you want people to see you? He stressed the importance of having a positive attitude. And if you are positive and motivate your people, they will motivate you. There are a few other leadership qualities that he emphasized that I wanna mention. One is it's important for him, the leader, to be credible and be focused during the time of crisis. He talked about being inclusive getting information and different perspectives to inform his decisions and to build the ownership among his team for the decisions that were made. He talked about the importance of being decisive and how important it is to adapt, but, but staying true to Duke basketball mission and values. And the mission and values for Duke basketball include integrity, trust, dignity, and selfless service. 
And this gives Duke basketball a solid foundation while their environment is changing because of coronavirus. He also talked about the importance of constant communication outside with different stakeholders and the public, but internally all the time, big groups, small groups, and individually with his players. And lastly, he cared for his players. He showed compassion for his players. It was about the team, not me. Have each other's back and they will have the leaders back. I think these are great lessons for crisis leadership, not only for Duke basketball, but for other organizations. So I wanna thank you for your interest. Um, leadership can be hard. It's even more difficult in high risk environments and it's really difficult in times of crisis. Often crises bring out the best in leaders, which we're seeing in many leaders now with coronavirus across the globe. And leadership is something that you should keep learning. Learn from example, people who you want to model, people who you do not want to emulate, and keep, keep going. So I wish you great success. Over to you, Shafiq. Thank you, Dr. Sisson. Uh, it was really a very enriching and presentation, and I'm sure all participants like to benefit from it. So I'm going to open space now for questions. I'm going to start with Kamal Abbas. Kamal? Okay. Maybe you, can you read the question? No, Amira, 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 do you have a question? No, I don't. No, I don't have a question. It, it's it's really wonderful to have this uh, uh, this amount of knowledge and uh, this amount of uh, it's, it's a very rich uh, content. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Nahla, Nahla Fayad. I have a question. Oh, I'm hello, Natalia. Natalia. <laughs> May I? For sure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I teach policy, conflict sensitive policy, uh, and I know that policy can be only as successful as it's implemented. So I learned a lot uh, from your presentation. But you, you gave us several examples of your work uh, in fragile um, conf in conflict situations like Pakistan, Kenya, Kosovo, and, and so on. And you gave us this graph how USAID assesses risks. And it was, it was interesting for me uh, that in all these countries, you have you know, a combination of risks. So my question is how you choose, because in Pakistan, once again, you gave an example when you, you had to save a project, huge money, embarrassment, several risks. Uh, so you focused on judiciary risks, how to deal with uh, corruption. But it's also an environment of huge insecurity. So can you talk about this, how you dealt with this risk and my second question is actually you know connected to that if you have these risks of you know high prominence both corruption and insecurity and you know that people who can help you with security risks are also very corrupted how you deal with this trade-off oh that's a tough one okay um you need to deal with all of the risks, obviously. You know, if it's, if it's not as big a risk or you have more of a tolerance for risk, maybe you don't need to prioritize that quite as much. In Pakistan, um, security was the paramount risk. Um, not only for us, but for Pakistanis. Um, when we interviewed um, Pakistani businessmen what was the top constraint 
to the success of their business. It's interesting, most of them said that the number one problem was electric power supply. But in the province of Punjab, the number one constraint on their business was the fear of being kidnapped. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, people uh, working on our projects was kidnapped and subsequently got killed. And many people working on our projects got killed. And people in our embassy were attacked while I was there. So this was really important. And, 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 and the American embassy, obviously, we were a prime target because of Al Qaeda and what was going on uh, with the Taliban and what was going on next door in Afghanistan. This really constrained us. Uh, we had a lot of information, uh, not only from the uh, American intelligence community, but from all kinds of organizations to inform us. Our partners who were implementing on the ground were great sources of information. And what this meant was we took a lot of precautions. Uh, we were very careful where we went. Uh, that we had a lot of security with us on field trips. I, 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 I was always in an armored vehicle. I had guards. Um, and, and often we could not travel. We would get information saying there is a threat. You better go at another time. And, and we were always up against the security people because we wanted to go. And, uh, and this is true in all embassies where I've worked. You know, it's obvious many times you, you can't go. There are other times where it's a gray area and, and some security officers are a little bit com more comfortable in the gray area and others are not. I feel it's important to take smart risks uh, and go with security, you know, learn about where you're going, uh, work with the right people. Um, in terms of, um, and so but anyway, so that's how we dealt with it in Pakistan and in other places. It, it is a constraining factor. Oh, and another important way to deal with it though is like, how do you monitor, monitor projects in a really high threat area? Let's say, you know, in Pakistan, we had a lot of projects on the Afghan border. And frankly, Americans often were not allowed to travel there because we'd get kidnapped. So what do you do? How do you monitor a project? So we would do third party monitoring. We would hire lo local groups. We would do um, satellite imagery and photographs. Um, and, and our partners would give us information. So there are, there are ways you can deal with it. The second part of your question was about dependence, reliance on uh, nefarious groups for security. Um, I haven't come up against that in my experience, but it is a big problem. It's an issue now in Afghanistan for some uh, project implementers who've, you know, I, I understand have hired organizations tied to warlords for security. And, and I understand there are actually some lawsuits that are pending on this. Um, I don't have an easy answer for that, Natalia, except um, get other sources of information. Um, and, and there are a lot of sources of information. You don't have to be dependent on a warlord. Okay. Hey. Uh, thank you for your answer. I'm going to ask about, uh, like, like there's a question from uh, Nahla. I'm going to take the question of Nahla and then uh, I'm going to ask the questions from the chat box. Hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> how are you? Thank you for this wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Okay. My pleasure. Uh, we didn't mention uh, the different kind of risks. As we know, we have the inherent risk the control risk and the detection risk. Uh, and we cannot advance in life without taking risk. We know this. We should have a risk assessment, always we should always have a risk assessment uh, procedure uh, to know how to manage and to react to these risks. 
uh, okay? And uh, I want to mention, I propose, I think if we, uh, in, uh, when we have high risk, it's good to proceed in baby steps, I guess, to be able to adapt to changes. If you agree, I don't know. Uh, because uh, like this, we, we can adapt. And, uh, and one thing I want to mention, we did, you did not mention anything about the psychological support, which I think it's very important for any organization and the grievance mechanism, grievance mechanism. And mainly, I would suggest that the organization should give um, uh, credible sources of information, should ask uh, its employees or anybody to, have, to follow credible sources of information. Because we know we cannot get information from any source. We need the credible uh, information. Okay, thank you, Nahlo. I think those are great comments. Um, if we need, in a risky environment, we do need to take steps. We, we can't stop. We need to act. But my point is, do it in a smart way and understand your risk and take measures to mitigate it. And there are different ways you can do that depending on the nature of the risk. Um, but, and, and you're so right, Nala, about the importance of adapting. It's really a great, it's important to have a strategy. It's important to have a mission, vision, and values and clear objectives, but you need to adapt you're gonna to need to change and vary your objectives and your targets and how you're gonna achieve them because you're gonna get new information. And the environment you're working in is so complicated that it's impossible to know everything perfectly in advance, particularly with all the complicated inter interrelationships. I mean, in Google, when they put out a product, they don't wait to have perfect information they get pretty good information and they put it out there and they get feedback and then they iterate. Um, now, you don't want to fail on something that's going to cause damage or loss of human life. I mean, you want to do it smartly. But this importance of adaptation is really key. And USAID and the British and many other organizations more and more are turning to what they call adaptive management. Uh, and it's really good to have a learning agenda to accompany that adaptive management. So what are the issues you want to keep learning about to inform your adaptation? Great point. I also yeah. agree with you on psychological support. Yeah. That's what I meant about caring for your staff. Um, in, um, you as a leader need to take the temperature of your people and see how they're doing. Um, I remember in, in Kosovo, there was a senior person on our staff who wasn't performing to the expectations of the other senior staff. And, and they were giving him a really hard time. I was giving them a hard time because he wasn't delivering and we were in a crisis situation. I mean, we had, you know, chaos in Kosovo. But I, went, I took him out for lunch and he started crying. You know, this is a senior experienced officer. And he was crying because he was going through a messy divorce at home. He was losing custody of his kids. And he was in danger of cracking up. So I needed to deal with that. And I needed my boss, the director, and the other senior staff to deal with that without going into too many details about this guy's personal life. We did not want him to blow up and we couldn't lose him. So we had to manage it. We needed to show compassion and just help him work through his problem. Uh, but there are a lot of other resources you can do to care for your staff. I also take your point about grieving. Um, in Kenya, I moved there after the embassy bombing in 1998. 
and the embassy got blown up. Uh, when I was in, in USAID in Kenya, we had a psychiatrist come to our office every week to provide anonymous counseling for our staff. But we also had public grieving. We had a memorial services every year celebrating the staff who we lost. And all of the injured people, including a blind employee, came to that ceremony. But that's really important for healing and staying strong. So thank you very much for that. And you're so right also about credible information. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Andrew, there is a question in the chat box uh, from Mo. Uh, his question is, it makes sense that it's safer for NGOs to avoid headline, especially if there's relying on voluntary uh, foreign funding. In the case of revealing a scandal due to internal investigation, should the organization then share the results publicly? I'm sorry, should they share information about the scandal publicly? Yes. The results publicly. Wait. I would say uh, yes. I think you want to manage it, but I think it's better to go public before it goes public with the media. Okay. But I would talk with your media experts, your information and communications experts. For any crisis, including one like this, you need to have a communication strategy. Mm -hmm. What are the messages you want to get across? What are the audiences you want to reach? And how do you want to do it? And when do you want to do it? You need to tell the truth. You do not want to speculate about like the potential impact of the crisis on your organization. You do not want to overpromise. Um, but you want to get a, a handle on it. I, I think I might first instinct is in a very careful way going public but i would talk with your communications experts uh, before doing that and figure out how you want to manage it good okay. question yeah also i have a question from other team of the day said thank you so much for this wonderful presentation i'm up day but we morocco at the my question is how do you see dealing with universal crisis such as such as covid 19 pandemic where there is a uh, Area, only two uh, opinions uh, either to transfer all the organization's activities to online or to stop it till, uh, after a crisis. Let me make sure I understand the question. Is it so with the COVID? If, should we asking go online? Yeah, there's two options. You, rather you go online or you have to stop uh, your activities because of the coronavirus, the corona pandemic. So, uh, uh, how do you see it dealing with you know, with a universal crisis such as like corona pandemic, where, where you have only two options? I think you want to keep going, and 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 you find new ways to achieve your mission. And if it's online, do that. Um, there are so many creative ways that people are figuring out now to use yeah. online approaches to solve problems. You know, there's this, this little phrase I learned as a kid that a lot of American kids learn, which is uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And that's what's going on now. Um, when uh, I was, we were teaching at Duke University um, recently, because of the coronavirus, we needed to switch from learning in the classroom to learning online. That was a huge disappointment. Uh, that interaction, personal interaction is, is really rewarding. But adapting to online teaching worked. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't the same, but it was a lot better than nothing. Yeah. And I think that's true for running an NGO, doing service delivery. Um, we can figure it out. Um, and that's much better than quitting. Yeah, the world has changed and our normal ways of operating have to change, so we have to adapt. So I have, right. have a question with, from Etienne, Etienne Saar. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Sisson, Professor Sisson, for uh, this amazing uh, presentation. 
um, from Canada. I have two questions. It's one, it was, it's, it's more about the uh, politicians, and the other one, it's more in an industry uh, level. So this question about politicians, would it be a good gesture of leadership from our political leaders to show their taxes, assets, and mm -hmm. also to know more about their recent uh, health exam? That's the first one. And uh, the second one, uh, at the start, you talked about uh, inspire people with trust and inspiration, Mr. C. Sison. Um, with uh, this kind of, um, I mean, in a more level industry, factory level, manufacturing level for uh, engineers in leadership, um, what kind of uh, concrete actions uh, we could do? How can we get people uh, the trust and the motivation uh, from our um, co-workers and the future stakeholders? Those are great questions. The first one, I'd say in some ways it goes beyond my presentation, except it does go to the credibility of leadership. Personally, I believe that politicians should make available all of that information because it's about being transparent so that the people they want to lead will be informed about them. It's a, a way to promote credibility, I believe, and honesty and trust. Um, most politicians, not most, but at least in the United States, uh, most presidential candidates have done that. You know, Trump is obviously a significant exception. but. Um, but in general, I think such transparency is good. <clears throat> because it goes to your second point, ATN, about inspiring trust. Um, trust is the essence of leadership, especially in uncertain situation where you want people to follow you, even if the future is unclear. Trust is vital. So what can you do to promote trust. Communication is important um, and consistent messages and being honest and don't over promise and under deliver. Uh, it's important to show compassion and connect with your people. Empathy is a really important trait for good leaders. Uh, and, and somehow relate to them. Show that you have the same human anxieties that they do. Like in coronavirus now, whether you're, you know, the president or a governor or, you know, working in a store. I mean, we all face the threat of coronavirus and, and some of the same anxieties. Leaders should show compassion for their people. I think symbolic acts are important. Uh, don't tell people to do one thing and then do something else. That's why Mandela's act of putting on that rugby shirt from a white rugby team was a, a really powerful image. Um, I would argue now, I mean, my personal view, where you know the US government has said that people should wear face masks when they go outdoors or they're interacting with other people. It sets a powerful example for other people, whether or not leaders themselves wear the mask. Um, if um, a leader tells somebody in, a, in an organization to do something, they should follow the same rules. It's really important to follow the same rules. I can tell you a really bad example of this. I once worked in an embassy where there were really tight security restrictions on our behavior. We were told to stay away from certain nightclubs because they were connected to organized crime. And we did not want to damage the reputation of the American embassy by going there. And we did not want to put our people at risk by going to such a nightclub. Well, we found out that a senior embassy official with his security was going to those nightclubs. That was 
terrible for the reputation of the embassy and it really undermined the trust of American embassy staff in that leader. Really bad mistake. If you have travel re restrictions, like your staff should not go to a certain place because it's off limits. You as the leader shouldn't go to those places unless it's a really clearly understood ex exception and people understand that occasionally you need to make an exception. You need to be transparent about it. Um, another good example is taking gifts. When you're the director, people like to give you gifts because they want your business. Don't take the gifts. Or if you have to take the gifts because you don't want to offend somebody, make it clear that the gift will belong to the organization and not you personally. So those are a few points I'd like to make. Thank I wish this would happen in Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about gifts here. Uh, and corrupt, corrupted politicians, unfortunately. So there is a question about the importance of emotional intelligence for leaders as understanding emotions and controlling them can help managing crisis and building successful uh, connection with staff. Okay, what's the question? So the question is that about the importance of emotional intelligence for leaders. So uh, understanding emotions and controlling them can help managing crisis and building successful connections with staff. I think you are absolutely right. It's very important for a leader to be calm under pressure and not blow up. Because when you're in a crisis situation or a high risk situation, anxiety goes way up. And the last thing you want is for your staff to think you are out of control. I think it's important for you to show that you also share their anxieties and worries. That would be dishonest to say everything's fine, I don't feel any problem. But you need to be controlled about it and still show confidence and a positive attitude. Emotional intelligence is critical. You need that to be aware of yourself and to be aware of what's going on with your team. To be honest with you, this was not one of my greatest strengths as a leader. In, in USAID, I was usually among the very last people in the office, even when I was a director, to hear about all the gossip and the rumors going around the office. You know, people would tell me everything about projects, but I was the last one to know about, you know, what's going on with their families or who's, you know, got relationships with who. Uh, it was just, I was not really well clued into that. And so one way I dealt with that weakness is I made sure that every mission where I was a director, I had a deputy who was really different from me. I wanted ideally a, a, a deputy who was a woman, but at a minimum, was really clued in to the other aspects of emotional intelligence where I was lacking. And, and then we worked together as a, a team. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, any more questions? Okay, Sana. Sana. Hi, thank you for, for your presentation and thanks to you for organizing this webinar. Sure. Uh, I had some, some issues with my internet, so maybe I missed I miss some details. But my question is about how, how a leader can, can deal uh, with many crises at the same time. Like for yeah, example, for the, for, the, for the pandemic, uh, we can say that uh, the risks profile of organization has changed completely. So should that, should, uh, do, should, do we uh, change completely the priority of, of risks or we can deal or find any balance between them? Thank you. What a, a great question. 
And it's really hard because um, leaders in all situations are juggling, handling many different kinds of priorities. And um, in the time of crisis, uh, there are more. And the crisis itself, let's say there's one like the pandemic, that's number one. But let's say you're leading uh, an organization in a place that's suffering from other crises like civil conflict or an environmental disaster or a corruption scandal, as well as the pandemic. A leader needs to have a very thoughtful, quick, but thoughtful process working with others on the team, consulting with stakeholders to figure out how to prioritize. You cannot do every single crisis the same amount of effort at the same time. There are only 24 hours in the day and you can't work 24 hours a day. Um, you need to prioritize. And the one way of looking at that is what's most urgent now and what's most important for the immediate term, the short term, the medium term, and the long term. So you can spread it out. And then maybe you can delegate certain things. Certain things you absolutely must deal with now because it may involve the, the safety and the, the, the lives of your staff or your families or the people you serve. That is more urgent, for instance, than something that's jeopardizing, you know, the effectiveness of your project down the road. Um, you may need to just say, we're going to stop doing certain things for a while. Um, so it, it's tough. You, you need to, to make some really hard choices about what you're going to focus on because you can't do everything at the same time. I'd also urge you um, in a time of crisis to take care of yourself. That has to be a priority. Um, when I was in Kosovo as deputy director, um, it was a crisis situation. We were trying to do everything at once. I worked for seven months before I took a Sunday afternoon off. And I averaged over 100 hours a week working. That was a mistake. It was really a mistake. Uh, and it manifested as a mistake in different ways. I was just not as good a leader as I should have been. Don't let that happen to you. Find ways to take care of yourself. You don't need to take off 10 hours a day. And you're obviously you can't just escape for two weeks. But crises like this go on often for a long time. And you cannot, you need to be in there working hard today, but you also need to have the ability to work hard a month from now and six months from now. And you need to keep thinking clearly. So get some time to yourself, find some support mechanisms, do get some exercise. Don't drink so much, don't take smoke so much. Maybe do yoga, um, but that's really important so that you remain effective as a leader and can juggle all of these things today, but also tomorrow. But, uh, I yeah. ask a question, a last question. I'm very okay, sorry. Push, push, push. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, you talked about, uh, we, we just discussed about concrete actions like communication, consistent message, and don't overpromise. Uh, in a more level of, uh, um, projects, uh, how can I get some wins beside everything which is related to the communication? Uh, what can I do to get some wins uh, with my staff, with my people, uh, Mr. Sison? I'm not following you. Do you mean wins in terms of the project actually successfully delivering results? Yes, exactly. Oh. It's good to have um, clear objectives for your project and good metrics and metrics that look at short medium and longer term results 
um, that 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 could be the discussion topic for you know ten other webinars, but. It really is important to celebrate success, but to celebrate success, you need to have good evidence that it's real. And you're right, you don't want to overpromise. And then when you do have success, you need to demonstrate with evidence. And in six months, that those good results aren't going to be as much about impact, but more about you know good progress making delivery of services, let's say. And you're going to need more time to have the evidence to demonstrate that you're really having a positive impact. But either way, you want to have good systems to demonstrate that you're achieving results. And then, then you can celebrate those with your team, such as with ceremonies or other things you can do, yeah. and then publicly. Yeah, I think the crisis. I agree with me, Dr. Sisson, that during crisis, it's much better to like to design small wins and start working on small projects and start working to, to finalize those projects and design this win. If you can keep going with working on your projects at the same time you're dealing with the coronavirus, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but I would also think about how is the coronavirus affecting your staff and how it's affecting your projects. I mean, maybe you need to adapt your projects. Um, a lot of places are becoming much more fragile because of coronavirus. Um, and, and it's not only our staff that's becoming more at risk and, and fragile because they're dealing with so many of their own family problems as well as doing their jobs. But but the people you're working with on project sites and the beneficiaries and the stakeholders, it's more fragile out there. And, 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 and the ramifications of that fragility are only beginning to be seen. Um, you may want to adjust your projects uh, to, to deal with that. The last two questions, okay, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll close. So, uh, Nahla and Doha Sabah. Nahla, please. Uh, it's not really a question, just I want to thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, presentation. We rarely do participate in a uh, presentation taken from real life experiences. Mostly we have theory, and uh, mm. you know, really it was great presentation I thank you very much and most important I want to restate what you said one should take care of himself when we take care of ourselves we can be the example and the other will follow and will take care of themselves also thank you very much thank you so much Nahla. thank you uh, Doha? Uh, from my side I also want to thank you for your time and for this amazing presentation uh, and I wanted to ask you how to avoid spoilers when being in a leadership position. Interesting. Do you mean spoilers within your organization or outside? Exactly, within the organization and also sometimes outside. What do you mean by a spoiler? Um, it's people maybe who might have a different strategy than yours and are pushing toward that side and uh, do not really allow you to uh, do things uh, as you plan them and do, they do affect uh, the other employees or the, the team itself also. Okay, good. Um, I believe that leaders in all kinds of environments need to be inclusive in their decision making, but then they need to be decisive and tough. Inclusive meaning as inclusive as makes sense for the situation for figuring out what you want to do and how, how to make decisions. Now, depending on the situation, you're going to be more or less inclusive. You know, if you're in your office and there's a fire in the building, you don't want to have an inclusive process to figure out whether or not you're going to leave the building. You just need to know and decide we're leaving. 
But if you're designing a project or you're deciding what to do in a sector, be inclusive, especially of people who disagree mm -hmm. and get their point of view and make clear to people that you respect everybody's views and you want people to argue with you. Argument is good. Um, and, and that you pledge to them that you will use a process that's fair. But then also make clear to them that you are responsible for making the decision if, if that's the decision reaches to your level because there are other cases where you may delegate it. But let's say it's for you to make the decision. You need to make it clear that when that happens, that's the decision. And you can argue with it internally, but honor it. And publicly, do not go against the decision. That is not acceptable. And there will be um, sanctions for doing that. Uh, insubordination is not to be um, tolerated. But I think it's important as a leader to make it clear up front that these are the way you, the ways you operate. These are your, you respect, you want inclusion, you want diversity, you want healthy argument about ideas, about not about people. Uh, you want people to go against you on arguments. But on the other hand, you want discipline once the decision is made. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Sisson, for agreeing to give us this webinar. As I said before, it was very enriching. Uh, and um, thank you also for this idea, like for all the doctors who present also here, like jo John, Roy, uh, Francis, Natalia, thank you so much for attending. Um, hope to like to do a lot of webinars with DCID and thank you so much for your trust. Uh, once again, final word for you, uh, Dr. Sisson. Well, Shafiq, um, thank you so much for inviting me. I want to thank my uh, Duke colleagues for suggesting I do this. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your, your great questions and comments. I mean, maybe I'd conclude just by saying, you're right, Anala, I am not an academic. It's been fun teaching at Duke, but I am not an academic. I'm a practitioner. And one of the things I've been learning as a practitioner is I love to keep learning, and it's essential to keep learning. Uh, and I recognize, I recognize I make mistakes. I try to avoid them in the future. And then I learn more coming to a place like Duke University because then I can look at all the literature and talk with my colleagues. And I'm gonna talk more with Natalia about her thoughts about hiring warlords for security. Um, and I mean, it's just important to keep learning um, and, and finding people who Matt blend you want the, the scholarly academic inputs as well as the practitioners. And I really congratulate you um, as people, as leaders. Uh, it's, it takes courage. And I, I respect what you're doing and, and, I, and I really wish you well. And I hope you and your families stay safe during this time. Thank you, Dr. Andrew, stay safe. Thank you guys for attending. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.